Ordinarily on the Sunday of Pentecost, the scripture reading that is read is from the second chapter of Acts. And we'll be making reference to that passage in a few minutes. But I have chosen a passage from what might seem like an unlikely source for Pentecost. The Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. And this is from chapter 16 and I'll begin at the 10th verse. Leading up to this passage, I should say that uh, what has happened is, is that God, Almighty God has decided to choose a new king. And so he sends this, the prophet Samuel or it's to go to Jesse, the home of Jesse the Bethlehemite, and to anoint the new king. And so Samuel goes to Bethlehem, sees Jesse, and Jesse parades all of his sons, the more likely candidates, for kingship before the, the prophet. But none of these is the one whom God has chosen. And this is the point where we pick up the story. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him. We will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. In the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now, throughout history, there have been remarkable people who, by their very presence and leadership, have transformed the world around them. They could have done this in the midst of a very critical situation, transforming perhaps in a different situation an entire organization. Perhaps they were working in the midst of a great conflict, some even changing the course of human history. Well, Baron von Steuben is an example of this. Perhaps you have heard of him. Baron Van Steuben presented himself to General George Washington when the Continental Army was held up at Valley Forge in that brutal winter when all seemed lost. And Baron Van Steuben was instructed by Washington to train the army, to drill them, to whip them into shape. Now, Baron Von Steuben was not all, as it turns out, what he claimed he was when he presented himself to Washington, but nevertheless, he did a very, very good job. He trained them. He drilled them. He even wrote a whole manual on what had, was the foundation of army procedure ever since. And the significance of this is that when the Continental Army first went into Valley Forge, they went in as a ragtag, defeated mob, and they emerged a disciplined formidable army and this changed the course of the revolutionary war the war was never the same after this and with the coming of american independence the world was never the same and all this was providential we have no idea how much one person can change not only the course of history can impact the world around us now, the greatest example of this, of course, is Jesus Christ himself. With the advent of Jesus, the totality of human history and eternity was never to be the same. But not just the impact on believers, but the entire world has been impacted by the Christian faith. And even the most secular historians would have difficulty disputing this, and they don't. But even mere mortals can have a profound impact on human life. To continue to just to name a few. Do you remember that time when the Arab world was certainly shocked, but the whole world was shocked when then President Anwar Sadat of Egypt 
made this unprecedented flight to Jerusalem to meet with his decades-long arch enemy of Menachem Begin to make the first step to try to bring peace between Israel and Egypt. And he paid for it with his life. And then in India, we remember Mahatma Gandhi, who not only his work eventually led to the independence of India, but in South Africa and India, he challenged the evil of apartheid and the caste system and taught a whole population of people how to respect and to learn the value of every human being. He also paid for it with his life. And someone who was very impressed by Gandhi's methods to change the face of America, Dr. Martin Luther King, a Baptist minister from Georgia, who also paid for it with his life. But inventors, artists, authors, educators, entrepreneurs, people of all sorts have impacted our world. And bringing this much closer to our home, do I dare say, that the trajectory and the the growth of First Presbyterian Church has been greatly impacted by the ministry of Dr. Doug Pratt. Would you say so? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but what about you? In your own sphere of influence, have you ever given much thought to the impact that you have had on God's world? Are you inclined, inclined to discount your impact as not being valuable? Well, this morning I invite each of you to think on it now. Not only what you have done, but what you could do. And I mean every one of you not just a select few, but every one of you in your own sphere of influence, in your own place in life, I want to invite you to think about the impact that you may have on the world around you. Now those of you who have been to the great banquet perhaps have recognized the sermon title to renew the face of the earth. Yes, this is a phrase that comes from the prayer to the Holy Spirit. And during the banquet, we pray that prayer often, especially during every time we are about to have one of the talks, we pray the prayer to the Holy Spirit. Because this acknowledges the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. It expresses our faith that He, the Holy Spirit, is ever at work. He's there to guide, to sustain, correct if necessary, brings healing, empowers, gifts. Some of you perhaps don't even know that you can pray to the Holy Spirit, directly to the Holy Spirit. And as in the statement of faith that we just read, we recognize that we are talking about Almighty God after all. The Holy Spirit is one of the persons of the Trinity. And of course you can have a relationship with him. A relationship with the Holy Spirit. We must always remember that the Holy Spirit is a he, not an it. It's not a may the force be with you. We are talking about Almighty God himself. And so these things remind us of the purpose of Pentecost. Now some have suggested that Pentecost is like the birthday of the church. It's when the church first got started. When the Holy Spirit descended upon the first believers and empowered them with what we call the tongues. Is Jesus instructed them not to leave Jerusalem until they were empowered on high. And sure enough, on, at this time, they were in fact waited until they were filled before they moved. Now, this empowering of the first disciples, this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and, ha and he has renewed the face of the earth and continues to do so through each generation according to his purpose. So Pentecost continues, you see. Now, the Holy Spirit continues this work primarily through the church. Yes, us. 
And we acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit by the symbolism of burning candles. That's why we light them every Sunday morning. And he works not only in this church, but in all, through all God's churches. And it has been said that God chooses to do his work through the church. And there is no plan B. Yes, it's us, my friends, through whom the Holy Spirit works to renew the face of the earth. But it's important for us to always remember, at the most basic level, that, the, that this ministry is not so much our ministry as it is his. We are the Holy Spirit's instruments. We are called to join him in what he is doing. Now, isn't that awesome? Think about that for a moment, that each one of you as individuals, as well as we collectively as a church, are partners in the Holy Spirit's work. And when we recognize that, we can pers persevere like champions because we know that we are a part of something much bigger than ourselves. And all of those things that Jesus taught us, and he told us that the Holy Spirit would come and remind us and teach us what all that he taught and sometimes those things are difficult. And we think, I can't do this. Well, maybe you all by yourself cannot. But through the power and empowering spirit, through the Holy Spirit, yes, it is possible. And we can persevere and trust that what God calls us to do, we can in fact do because we're part of something so much greater than ourselves. Now, don't think for a moment that the Holy Spirit only turned up at Pentecost. Because we are still talking about Almighty God, after all. So he was present, the Bible says, at creation. And note the passage I read you about David. When he was anointed to be king, the Spirit of God did what? It rushed upon him. Just like it rushed upon the first disciples at Pentecost. And then the same thing was said of Saul when he was anointed king. Notice what the scripture says about this. He's told that the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you. And you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now what does that mean? Be turned into another man. Well, this is exactly what Jesus was referring to when he had that conversation with Nicodemus. Do you all remember this? In John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes, a, a temple leader. He's part of the Sanhedrin. He comes to Jesus at night. And he says, Rabbi, there's something going on here because you can't possibly be doing all these things if God isn't with you. And Jesus' response to him was what? Nicodemus, you won't even see the kingdom of heaven unless you are what? Born again. Born again of the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that the Holy Spirit comes upon you and transforms you from the inside out to the point where you're you're not the same person. Your, your, your spiritual DNA has been transformed. And so now you think differently. You view the world differently. You love differently. You desire differently. Everything has been transformed in the depth of your spirit. You become like another man or woman, as the case may be. Now, King David, the spirit rushed upon him each day forward. And he was transformed and he became a man after God's own heart, the scripture says. And he is the sweet psalmist of Israel. He is, has another title of his. And he played the harp. How appropriate that we have a harp this morning. Just as David, King David played the harp. But do you remember King David, the scripture says how he would exercise his gift and he would soothe the soul of King Saul when he was troubled. Remember that? And what a wonderful metaphor that is by one who is empowered by the Holy Spirit and the impact that such a person can have on the lives of others. He soothed Saul's soul. This makes me think of my own dear mother who was in a, one of the executive secretaries at the city hall in the municipality in St. Louis County where I grew up. Now you can imagine at City Hall, people who work in City Hall, they get into conflict with each other and they're going at it and being very angry. And my mother just had this way about her that she could step in the middle of that and somehow disperse the anger and, the, and talk to them. And they started to communicate with each other and they walked away and they come to a good resolution. You can also imagine people, citizens, calling City Hall. They're not always happy. And they call City Hall and they're upset about something. 
And even if they have a legitimate complaint, they may not express it in the nicest way. And they call City Hall and they're yelling and complaining and blaming and whatever this. And mom could just talk to them on the phone and could dispel the anger, talk them through it, give them the answers that they're looking for. And by the end of the conversation, they would go away laughing and having a very pleasant conversation. She just had this kind of impact. In fact, it got to the point where people would call City Hall, even if it was a different department, but yet still ask for her because they knew they'd get a friendly voice, they would get a straight answer, and they would, they would get them somewhere. It would be a good experience with City Hall. This is what Jesus meant when he was talking about we are the salt and light. That the salt, that we are like a preservative of the community. And we also bring that special flavor to life. And that we bring light, that we bring a different way of viewing things, a different way of being. We demonstrate a different way in which we approach one another. Now, Pentecost was originally one of the harvest festivals of the people of Israel. The first day of the week after Passover was called the first fruits. And that's where you brought the barley offering into the temple. It's how appropriate that Jesus was resurrected on the first fruits. Because he is the first, root, first fruits of the resurrection, of the new covenant, of the new life. But then 50 days after Passover was the second harvest festival where then you brought in the wheat offering. And that was the day when the Holy Spirit rushed upon... You got this imagery now from Saul and David rushed upon the, new, the, the first believers to begin their work that we are called to continue today. Now in their case, they were empowered with the gift of tongues. They were able to speak in other languages so they could fulfill Jesus' great commission to go out into the world and make disciples. But we have been empowered with a variety of gifts. Now, the Apostle Paul has described in his letters, has given us several lists of those gifts that the Holy Spirit empowers his church with. Now, we're not going to go through them all today. That's a time for another class or another sermon. But the important thing to remember is this. Paul says that every one of us has a spiritual gift or gifts. And those lists of spiritual gifts that he shares in Corinthians and other places, he says every single one of us has been gifted in some way. And that the church needs all of them. Just like the human body has so many different parts. And you don't realize how much you value that part until it's not working or you don't have it anymore. Right? Right? It's the same way with the church. God empowers every single one of us with a spiritual gift of some sort. And this church and God's church in general needs all of them. And also it's not appropriate for any of us to discount any of those spiritual gifts, how humble it might seem. Some of you might be saying, well, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't have the leadership like Dr. Pratt and preach sermons or teach Sunday school or play the harp or whatever. I don't do any of those high profile things. But... Whatever your spiritual gift is, is not any less important than what Doug does, what I do, what Sophia does, what Barbara does, what Tony does. It is all needed by the church. Now, there was a man by the name of Demos Shikarian. Demos, maybe some of you have heard of him. Now, he comes from a whole different tradition. that He was Pentecostal, so it's not quite the same tradition as ours, but the principle is the same. Demos' family came, uh, fr uh, first survived the uh, Armenian genocide in Turkey, and then later survived the Holocaust in Europe. And he came to the United States and became a very successful businessman. And he was studying that scripture about spiritual gifts. And he wondered, well, what spiritual gift do I have? I can't imagine I have one. And reading the old King James, he focused on the little word, helps. The gift of helps. What is that? So he started researching and he found out what that was. And he realized, he said, I'm not the kind of, I, I don't preach sermons. I don't teach classes. I don't, I'm not a prayer warrior. I don't do all these, other, all these wonderful spiritual gifts. But what I do, I, what I am gifted to do, is I'm a good at organizing and creating an environment for those who have those gifts to do their thing. 
So he created a ministry called the Full Gospel Businessmen's International. Maybe some of you have heard it. And the idea was to bring the gospel to the business world because that's where he, that's the, the sphere of influence he was in. And so as a result, he created this ministry and brought in all these preachers and teachers and prayer warriors and, and uh, all, people with a wide variety of gifts. And thousands upon thousands of people came to faith as a result of that ministry. And they very rarely ever saw him. But he was the one, God's instrument, in making that happen. And so he wrote a book called The Happiest People on Earth. We do not currently have it in a bookstore, but if you ever want it, Ed can get it for you. But what? His point in his book is this. The happiest people on earth, he discovered, are the ones who have discovered and identified what their unique spiritual gift is, according to Scripture, and spend their life living it out. Because they know that their life is in sync with what Almighty God has designed them for. And when you spend your life doing exactly what God has designed you for, and it is blessing others and glorifying him. They are the ones who have the, have the great joy and peacefulness and satisfaction knowing that their life was being well lived for the benefit of the church and for the world. It's essential that all of us figure that out. Knowing that you do have a spiritual gift, what is it? Now, before we say more about that, the Apostle Paul wants to insert something else in the midst of this. Because when he finishes this wonderful description of spiritual gifts, he says that regardless of what your individual gift might be, there's a one that is greater than all of them. And that's when he starts his famous chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, where he talks about the gift of agape love. And what he says is that I could have all of those other spiritual gifts, every one of them, but if I don't live it out with agape love, it is useless. I am nothing and because it, it's all done with the wrong motivation. What is agape? Now I know we read this passage at weddings all the time because everybody thinks Paul's talking about the warm, fuzzy love feelings and all that. That's not what he's talking about. I mean, it's, it's fine. We kind of say don't do it. But, but what we got to understand is what he's talking about is a type of love that's not dependent on feeling. Agape means self-sacrificing, unconditional love. That means in any situation, no matter how I might be feeling at the time, out of my discipleship to Jesus, I'm going to choose to treat this other person the way Jesus treated me. And when you read the description of love in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, you discover that all of those things you could actually offer to your worst enemy if you chose to out of discipleship. It's not dependent on how you feel. And this is the only way that Jesus' seemingly stupid statement, love your enemies, makes sense. He's not saying have warm, fuzzy feelings. That'd be nice. But oftentimes that's not likely. What he's calling us to is to agape our enemies. And until we can do it in that way, all the other spiritual gifts get stifled. Now, what is the evidence? How do we know? that I'm living out my spiritual gift? How do I know the Holy Spirit is working through us? How do I know that I've got a good grasp of this whole agape concept and I'm really being an instrument of the Spirit? Well, Paul gives us a clue. He describes the fruits of the Spirit. What is the result? What will people see? What will be the impact? Look what it says in Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, we could easily, maybe we will someday, we could do a whole ser sermon series on this one verse, taking each one of those as a sermon by itself. We don't have time to do that, so we're not going to exhaust this passage. But just think about it for a moment. There's that agape love. He starts with that. The word love there is agape. But think, okay, the next thing, joy. You see, when... I've said this before, that this, con this idea of a grumpy Christian, that's a contradiction in terms. How is that possible? When we realize what Almighty God has done for us through Jesus Christ, 
When we have the assurance that he's with us always and we're never alone, we can face any challenge. And that's whatever, however our life ends, that's not the end of the story for us. And we, we realize the joy of knowing Christ. There should be, no matter the circumstances, at our core, a joy and a peace knowing the great love of Almighty God in our lives. And do other people see this? It's not an act, not showing off, but the natural fruit of what is already in here, put there by the Holy Spirit. And then patience. What is patience about? People say, oh, I have a lack of patience. Well, that's probably because you're focused on yourself too much. We lose patience because we're not getting things the way we want them. And we get impatient. But when we realize agape love is, first of all, all about him, but it's going this way, it's all about the other person, then patience out of that agape love just flows from you. Folks, sometimes you're working too hard. And when we realize that this is a fruit of the Spirit, it's a result of what has already been transformed within us. And then all the rest, kindness, goodness, all the, imagine if all of God's people, all God's churches and every person in it across the world was living this out. Imagine the impact that would have in every sphere of influence. This, my friends, is how the Spirit renews the face of the earth. And he does it through his people. Now, all of us are not called to the same sphere of influence. Some people, like the ones I named, are on a world or national stage. Others are community-wide. Others have prominent positions in the church. But all of us have families, have neighbors, other associations. And at this moment, we all have somebody sitting right next to us. But ultimately, the number or the platform does not matter. Wherever God takes us, whomever God puts us in contact with, Wherever God places us and whatever sphere of influence he gives us, we are called to exercise for the good of all and for the glory of God our respective spiritual gifts. And it is essential then that we discover what that spiritual gift is or gifts. And being an instrument of the Holy Spirit, living out agape love and the fruits of the Holy Spirit that God draws out of us, that is how the Spirit works through us, and that is how the Holy Spirit renews the face of the earth. Now, my friends, finally, as I bring all of this together, if you get anything out of all of this, it's this. And I shared this with the church staff earlier last week as we contemplated Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. So he starts off by identifying brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, and so forth. So all these wonderful things. But dropping down a little bit, he says, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Now whenever Paul would write these things, and other places in the scripture, he talks about imitating him. The spirit of that is not, hey, everybody, I'm just, I'm the exemplary Christian. I am the model. Everybody should be paying attention to me. You know, like he's got a big head or something. That's not the spirit at all. What Paul is lifting up is something that all of you have experienced. All of you have had people in your life that you look up to. People who have impacted you, especially those who have impacted you spiritually who have shaped who you are as a Christian. People that you look to and say, I want to be like that. That's the way I want to be. Or at the very least, if I can't aspire to that level, I at least want to be somewhat like that. We've all had, and I shared with the staff some of the people in my life who taught me the great love of the word of God, who taught me the importance of an absolute commitment to Christ and a, and, a, and a love for other people and a recognition of the value of other people. 
And another who taught me the really how one is a shepherd of a congregation. I'll never aspire to Dr. Steinmeier's level, but I try. But what I want you all to understand is you might be that for somebody else. And you may not even know it. But you certainly could be that to someone else. As the Holy Spirit works through you, may never underestimate the impact that you have on other people who are around you for good or for e evil. Because sometimes we don't exercise this very well and it becomes a stumbling block to someone's faith or someone's wanting to even find out what Christianity is about because when they see Christians, they're not sure they want to be a part of it. But then on the other hand, Think of the opportunity that the Holy Spirit gives us by working through us. And when we exercise our spiritual gift and this, they see the fruits of the Spirit coming out of us. This is the whole point of Pentecost. So I encourage all of you to embrace Pentecost as your personal call to ministry, in your own uniqueness, in your own specific place, with your own giftedness of God, as we are his people, we are his instruments, and through us, he will renew the face of the earth. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise that when you ascended to heaven, you didn't leave us alone to somehow stumble through life ourselves. But you came to us again in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that everyone in this room will find a renewed sense of relationship with you, the Holy Spirit. That they will be open to your leading. That you will help them identify their unique gift for the good of all. And help each one of us, Father, to live our lives in a ways that glorifies you according to your purpose. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers, and we offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. sensed his presence and I knew this was a place where love abounds for this is a temple Jehovah God abides here and we are standing his presence on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all around. In his presence, there is joy.